frightened. They were unsure of what was happening. What was going to happen to their leader, Jesus? And consequently, what was going to happen to them? Because there they are, sitting around the table, sharing a Passover meal. They're all together. And they're eating this meal which we will come to call the Last Supper. And Jesus is preparing them for what lies ahead. They're hearing him say things like going to the Father and sending the Advocate and let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And the words just kind of washed over them. They could hear them but they weren't necessarily understanding what those words and phrases meant. You see, surely his disciples were near despair at this point in Jesus' earthly ministry. They thought repeatedly, how could they go on without him? 
How could they go on without him to lead and to guide the way? They were floundering. In today's gospel from John, Jesus promises that though he will return to the Father, he will ask the Father to send the advocate, the companion, the Holy Spirit, who will be with them forever. This companion is the spirit of truth, whose specific task is to teach them everything and to remain and to remind them of everything that Jesus had taught them. You see, it's because of Jesus' great love for the people and most especially his followers and the disciples that he seeks to encourage them. Jesus has great love for all of humankind and it is so far reaching and it is so deep that he wants to reassure the believers of his presence among them even when he's gone. He talks of spirit, but, but who is this spirit? What is this spirit? It's the same spirit that possessed and inspired him to preach at Nazareth. It's the same spirit that seized him to drive the money changers from the temple, to stand up courageously to the authorities that supported him in his last hours on the cross and which thrust him from the tomb to his resurrection. It is this same spirit that he will send to the believers. Some scholars contend that John was writing from a time that was toward the end of the first century when the early church was coming into its own. And yet the church was facing challenges both externally in the form of the Roman persecution and internally in the form of those perver perverting the teachings of Jesus and the disciples. The threat that was facing the early church community was this internal bickering and how it would weaken the church and the church's ability to be the church. John's concern is with what the church is becoming and being able to look into the future as to what the church will become. But the outside pressure and the persecution was rampant. How will the church survive? And so it is also said that while Jesus is speaking to the disciples, these passages were used to speak to those early church uh, believers, that they would need the Holy Spirit in order to be the church. Doesn't it seem as though the concerns of the early church are our concerns for the church in the 21st century? Doesn't a lot of this sound like the concerns that we voice today? How will we remain true to the teachings of Jesus? How will we be the church in the world? Here is a word of comfort. Remember that God created this world with a purpose and we are to be in relationship with God. And when we seem, and when we, it seems as though we couldn't get it right, then God sent Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit. You see, throughout all of salvation history, God is with us and for us. Jesus doesn't expect any of us to be Christians by ourselves. We are given the help that we need 
through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because how else could we follow his commands to love one another, to love the outcast, the downtrodden, the enemy? How else could we take up our cross and follow him? You see, everything that Jesus asks of us goes against culture and the world. Whether we are in the first century or in the 21st century. And to live the type of life that Jesus asks of us takes courage. It takes boldness and it requires support and help. And isn't it utterly amazing and wonderful that Christ gives us what we need so that we can be what he calls us to be. Perhaps you have noticed this for yourself in your own life as a follower of Jesus, that when you pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit, suddenly your prayers are more heartfelt. and They, they take on a depth that you never expected. When you read scripture, it becomes more illumined and you begin to see and understand better what God is asking of us. And the sacrament of Holy Communion becomes that moment of unity for all of us as we remember Christ and we anticipate his coming again. We cannot be the church without the Holy Spirit because little in the Christian faith is self-derived. Mostly none of it can be accomplished on our own without the empowering and the prodding of the Holy Spirit. You see, without this empowerment and without this prodding, the church is always in danger of becoming just another well-meaning, sometimes helpful, only human organization. That's what differentiates us from the United Way or the Red Cross or any of these wonderful organizations that seek to help others. We don't want to just be a nice, caring human organization. We are the church. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to share the good news with all who will listen and maybe then even to some who won't listen. As I was putting this sermon together, I began to think about that particular passage from John because um, I really resonate to it. It really strikes deep in my heart and perhaps yours as well. And I realized that every time that I conduct a funeral or a memorial service, I fight a sense of inadequacy. You are there to offer comfort. You are there to raise up the resurrection. And yet there sits a family that is devastated by loss. They're distraught. They feel keenly the loss of a beloved individual. And you know, it doesn't matter if the person has lived a long and wonderful and glorious life. We don't want them to go. And so no matter what the circumstance of that passing, I cannot adequately console a family. It's only when I read from John's gospel, only then do I feel a sense of purpose and a sense of consolation that I can share. And I generally look directly into the eyes of the family 
who are usually sitting right here in the front rows. I look at them directly and I say, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled and neither let them be afraid. Only then do I feel that I have done what I was called to do because Jesus came first and died for us and sent the Spirit to renew us and to reaffirm us in our faith. Jesus will not forsake us. He will send the Holy Spirit and it is this spirit that we can call upon to keep us from falling into the fathomless pit, to keep us from falling into any number of addictions, into destructive lifestyles, and into destructive self-destruction. I can say this with a conviction because if you look at scripture from beginning to end, you will see that the Holy Spirit, in Hebrew, ruah, 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 at the end of it, the wind, the spirit, it sweeps over the watery chaos of creation. It is breathed into Adam to give him life. And the prophet Joel prophesies that on that day, the Spirit will be poured out on young and old, on male and female. The Holy Spirit is intimately woven throughout the whole of Jesus' promises, in the whole of Jesus' life and ministry. As Christians, we are nothing without the Holy Spirit. It is with this gift that Jesus promises to give us what we need to be faithful. The Holy Spirit is the agent of God's kingdom. Even though that king kingdom being present is often hidden from us, the Holy Spirit helps to bring it to the fore. The Holy Spirit is the way that God keeps actively loving us in time and keeps pointing us toward the truth that's embodied in Jesus the Christ. By God's love, my friends, we live in an age of the Spirit, that new time in which the church exists and testifies to the world. You see, our time is not our own. No. And therein lies our hope. Amen. Amen. Amen.